Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of The Comeback Game, Inspired and Unstoppable. Uh, pretty pumped today because on the line I've got uh, Tom Bell or Thomas Bell. And uh, Tom's certainly got some stories when it comes to the ups and the downs, the ins and the outs. I've done a bit of research and I noticed that uh, Tom went from kind of nothing, sleeping on a couch to, to building a $170 million business or multiple businesses, uh, you know, quite up there. To, to kind of falling back off and, and losing that or, or getting another chance in life again. And so uh, without further ado, I want to welcome Tom. Uh, Tom, by all means, mate, who are you? What are you? What do you do with yourself? Well, let me correct you. First off, it wasn't somebody's couch. Back when I was 20, I was sleeping on subway ramps with my dog. So I was proper homeless. Wow. Eating from dumpsters the whole bit. Wow. But... Uh, I, I, man, where do you start? Like uh, back then, so maybe the first story is that little bit of inspiration. I can remember uh, it was it was free base and then crack cocaine. I was twenty, and uh, I've always been one of those full on kind of guys with whatever I did, which is a blessing if it's making money, and it sure is a curse if it's a drug addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and one day, frankly, I was. Eyeing the uh, bridge, the one that connects Manhattan to the Bronx, right where Yankee Stadium is. And that bridge was looking pretty good. And I, I walked into some Chinese restaurant and I just looked some guy in the eye and we caught each other's eyes just the right way and I just broke out into tears. And, you know, the guy just in New York, the city that's famous for people not giving a hoot, right? And this guy sat and talked with, with, uh, with me for like an hour. As I'm bawling, it's, you know, to this total stranger. Yeah, it was kind of that blessing and, and a, you know, a minor miracle on another front that, that I just decided to quit that day. And cocaine is expensive. It's very expensive for a 20-year-old. So I applied my, my – the way that I made money back then was I was kind of a showman. I, I would – I would fly this toy helicopter. Now remember, this is the 80s, so way before remote control, right? Or, mm. or you know, drones. Mm. But I would fly this little helicopter, you pull the string, and it would fly. And, and I would put on a show, and that's how I would make my money. Well, once I quit drugs, it was so much, I mean, I could make a fair amount of money selling those toys. Mm. So I, told, I sold them all throughout the country for about 10 years. And, and made a pretty good living at it. And, you know, I'm taking this whole story and going really fast with it. But one day um, I decided that, uh, that I wasn't going to sell the toys anymore. I had set them all out on a table in Shipshawana, Indiana. It's a big flea market. And, and they're, they're cardboard, the, you know, the packaging with the, the plastic that covers them. And it started raining. And my, my precise layout was ruined. And, and a lot of the toys were, the packaging was ruined. I turned to the guy next to me and I said, I quit. I'm done. I'm starting an internet company. And the thing is, this was 1997. I didn't even own a computer. I had never used one. But a week later, you know, I've told this story a bunch, so it sounds a little polished, but, you know, 100% true. So I got the computer, learned how to use it, and, and I, was, I knew how to work at festivals and, and events and flea markets. And I said, where's the flea market? I understand those. So naturally, it was eBay. And back then, you could sort all of eBay in a single click, in a single search, right? Yeah. So they had this thing. I don't know if they still do. It was called Dutch Auctions where they would have a, a, a number of an item and people would bid what they wanted to pay for either one or more or all. And I, I sorted for all the Dutch auctions and I found a product that I knew because I was buying my helicopters in China. So I found a product that I knew I could find in China and I found 11 sellers successfully selling a lot of these things. They were these little cell phone antenna boosters yeah, yeah, yeah. A little gold sticker that stuck, you know, to your battery. And, and I would get Navy engineers writing me, you know, about the science. But I didn't, frankly, I didn't believe it. 
but you know how they worked. And uh, it's the damnedest thing how I learned how to write sales letters. I never got to read a book, but I put together the 11 sellers. And of this 11, there was a number one in sales volume and a number 11. Literally. I mean, it sounds like a fairy tale. I wrote a, an eBay page, AKA sales letter. And I said more of what number one said and less of what number 11 said. $600,000 in four months. Wow. Yeah. Um, we were doing 99 cents for the product plus 499 shipping. And uh, I mean, it was a hell of a ride. You remember that Lucy show, I Love Lucy, where she would, you know, have all these giant mail carts. You know, if you do enough mail, they will give you a hamper. No kidding. It looks like a laundry hamper, this big thing to take home. And it was like, I Love Lucy, we had this wagon train at the end of every day with, with bins full of letters, right? And, you know, to make a long story really short, um, I had all these buyer email addresses and, and this was the nineties. Nobody was talking about email marketing, but I found this company back then. It was a brand new company called ClickBank. Yeah. <laughs> and I was running anything I would run. There was no targeting back then. And one day, well, this is great. One day, I got a letter from ClickBank from Jennifer, the receptionist, Jennifer Johansson. She's the president now of ClickBank. And she said, Tom, we have to close your account and take all your money. I called her and I said, why? Well, Tom, because you're a spammer. I said, Jennifer, these are buyer emails. They don't get any further from spam than buyer emails. Well, Tom, I'm sorry, but you're a spammer. She must have been reading from a, a, a script. Well, can I face my accuser, Jennifer? Well, I'd let you, except, well, you're a spammer. And uh, on it went. Finally, to this day, me and Jennifer joke about it. I said, the, you know, my infamous words. I said, Jennifer, I'm pretty sure that you're a girl. She, she says, yeah. I said, if I called you a boy 10 times, would you become a boy? Okay, Tom, you can have your money. So I said, all right, now tell me who's the accuser. Turns out this guy selling a grant product wrote a letter to ClickBank that said something like this. He said, I normally sell 30 books a day. I've sold 170 so far. I'm being spammed. Today I can as the culprit. Right. So Jennifer says, don't mail any more for this guy because he's kind of a jerk. And this, remember, this was the 90s. This was before tracking links or redirects or, you know, re retargeting. And I said, Jennifer, the mail's out. I can't take it back. So sure enough, three hours later, because with ClickBank, the way it works is if the vendor, if the affiliate is shut down, the vendor sees it because they're getting full commission on those sales. The ones yeah. that I'm saying, right? Yeah. So three hours later, this guy writes a second letter to ClickBank because when Jennifer turned me back on, I was getting commissions again. And this letter said, not only is today I can a, a spammer, but I can see now that he's a hacker too. Right. So this guy was selling reprint rights with his grant product, right? So I did the only, not, the only thing that I could do in that situation. I paid the $29 for reprint rights, stayed up for a day and a half and rewrote his book so that the spelling, you know, the errors were gone. And to make a long story short, four years later, we were sitting on $60 million from, and this is the kicker, because I wanted the guy to make good and sure he knew what, who it was. It was the Today I Can grant guide. <laughs> So that was how I got started. Was that a good answer for the question? <laughs> so, so, so let me get clear. You were selling his product. You were an affiliate of his product, the grant product initially? In the 90s, yep. And he had issues because you were selling an abnormally large amount of his product that you yes. must have been a spammer. So this guy had some 
some limitations or some blockages around being successful or getting great results that because it didn't make sense for him, it had to have been something outside of the system, yet it was just good marketing and good copywriting. It was a whole bunch of buyer's emails. That's what it was, really, back then. <laughs> Go back early to that, like eBay, you know, in the 90s, $600,000 in four months, so on average 150 k per month from a 99-cent product with a $4.95 delivery fee that's yeah. that's impressive it, it was it was as surprising to me as it was everybody else <laughs> and and the interesting thing was is is what i noticed is that it wasn't a reinvention of the wheel you just simply were smart enough to look at what was already working in the marketplace out of 11 sellers look at the difference between seller 11 and seller one it's copywriting the landing page basically modeled sellers number one landing pages, made some adjustments, made some changes, and all of a sudden inserted yourself up there at the top. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that really is. It, is simple. it was as simple as that. And then you've taken essentially the same strategy. You, you, were, you were put into a – you're a very resourceful man, Tom. <laughs> you know, like obviously things, things happened there, moved on, made money with a grant, faced an adversity, faced a challenge, and then found a way to overcome that, which was, you know, spend $29 to buy the rights, rewrite what was already working, made adjustments and changes, and turns into how much was it? 60 million in four years? 60 million from the grants, yeah, from that one yeah. project. And back okay. then, I mean, you know, for my insider friends, like the real brag from that, I mean, 60 million is a lot. For, for a lot of my, you know, guru friends or teacher friends, the real brag from today, I can, was we had a four-year stretch where we were selling 1,800 units a day. And if my conversion went down or up by more than a tenth, something was physically broken. It was so reliable. Like, I could find something, a bad server, or a broken link if my conversion went up or down by a tenth of a point. Yeah, those were the days. Those were the days. This is the interesting thing. Like I was, I was having a conversation um, or I ran a Facebook Live into, into our members the other day of our program because I see a lot of people that are constantly challenged in growing a business. And I think often sometimes they, we, us, don't stop to look at the bigger picture. There's this, there's this part of us that gets so caught up in the present moment in what's happening right now. There, there is this immediate gratification that, that's within society right now that if something doesn't happen, doesn't happen quickly or meet our expectations, you know, we, we feel challenged or we give up. And it's like growing a business is not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily difficult, right? What's difficult is having the consistency and the discipline and the focus to, you know, um, take action and execute even when things get difficult because you know like russell brunson talks about you're one funnel away you're one funnel away from you know creating phenomenal results in terms of lead generation or client client acquisition you're you know one sales letter away like look at what um, look at what gary halbert achieved with his coat of arms letter yeah. you know like we, we interviewed um kevin and bond uh recently and you know, the results that Gary achieved with one sales letter over, over the space of time, like we're talking millions of dollars, is yeah. just absolutely remarkable. Like it's not a matter of getting 10 things all right in your business all at once, but getting one thing right. Like you had a letter that, or a process that for four years consistently produced results. And as you said, if there was more than a 10% variance, it was because something was broken. Yeah. Like do you put that down to... I'm not saying this, but do you put this down to luck? Do you put this down to right place, right time? Do you put this down to preparation? Do you put this down to just having a phenomenal offer in the right marketplace? Like when you look back at those times in your life, like the eBay times, the grant times, like what do you think that it was that allowed you to go from, you know, being homeless to, to doing, you know, um, that, that those types of figures, $600,000 in four months, what do you put it down to, you know, going from being an affiliate, trying to be shut down to getting your money back and generating 60 million in four years? Like, what is it for you that you see was a key attribute 
or a strategy within inside of you? Because it's something within inside of you you replicated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to give you I want to give you the short answer, and then I want to honor you and and the listeners with a longer answer, right? Because the short Please. answer is, you know, something for me to put out there is, I have pretty bad self esteem. Mm. You know, if we're talking about girls or you know being an introvert in a crowd where I don't know anyone, I, I'm, you know, I'm pretty, pretty crippled with self-esteem. Mm. So the answer then, the truth then would have been, hell yeah, it was luck. Because my self-esteem wouldn't let me say anything different than that. Right? And I hadn't done some of the things that, that I now believe are special, you know, are mm. talents, right? Mm. So, that's the, that's the answer for men. The, the answer, as I, as I kind of, you know, learned a little bit more, and I still use this a lot, I call it selective delusionality. And that's that just the idea that I had no idea that it was impossible. Nobody told me. So we just did it. And people yeah. would ask me at the time when we were in the middle of it, well, how much are you making? I couldn't answer it. Because every time I did, I had to revise on the home side. To this day, when I work with people, I do not let them use time or money-based uh, projections or goals. Mm. Like, like I preach margin-based goals because that's how you scale. You don't get to a million. You don't get to two million in gross sales. You get to a 50% day zero uh, profit. Because <laughs> right? if you're making... 150% your investment on day zero, you can scale. Mm. And how much can you scale in your niche? I don't know. Let's find out. Mm. Right? So that, you know, that's, that's the medium answer. Mm. And the long answer is uh, nothing special about it. I have, I have a particular skill set. Oh, how does that one go? I will find you and I will kill you. But that, that scene from the movie. But I have a particular skill set, and it is what it is. And mm. in this whole information world, you know, this is bad a little. In this whole information world, I believe that there aren't any knowledge gaps left. Mm. Mm. You know, so all these people paying two and five thousand dollars for a very good reason. It's just not the reason most people think. Mm. They're paying all this money for what they think is a knowledge gap in their business mm. and it's always and look i'm an old timer now 21 years it's not a knowledge gap it's a motivation gap it's a mindset yeah. gap it's 100 percent of the time it's a mindset gap 100 percent. yeah 100 i i i i couldn't agree more and this is everything that that you know one of my companies stands for the game changers is bridging the gap between what we call the inner world and the outer world. Is it from the outer world perspective, you can find right now anything and everything that you need to grow a business online without even necessarily paying for it. But yeah. often that is as much of a curse <coughs> as it is, you know, a, a cause because it's like, well, there's 10 different ways. There's a hundred, a thousand different ways you could scale your company. You can generate leads a million different sales processes. And, and often, as you said, the biggest thing is understanding what is the internal motivator and then being able to execute in the face of adversity. And what I love most about what you share, like there's been so many amazing things, Tom, is you said that you didn't have a perception of what was possible. And it's been interesting that there's been a couple of people I've spoke to around that same thing. And you know, look at that story around the guy that broke the four minute mile is that no one had been able to do it. The moment that one guy broke the four minute mile, a number of people within months afterwards broke it because they then believed it was possible. Yeah. And I think that that's what makes the difference between, you know, the average business person, the game changers out there is the game changers have this insatiable hunger for more and to push that status quo and to push the boundaries and not, not fall short to the realm of what is perceived possible. Right. And secondly to that too is, 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 is what I noticed is a phenomenal strength of yours is that ability to model, that ability to not have to go out there and think of a necessarily a new way of doing things, but really utilizing everything that's available at your fingertips, putting your uniqueness into that and, and, and trusting that process and trusting yourself. Sure. And, you know, 
modeling has many different names. You know, one of my favorite little micro war stories from when I was homeless, it, in a nutshell, I, I went homeless because I would sell my toys on the subway trains and I had a dog and a girlfriend. And in January, the toy business gets very slow. So my girlfriend was, you know, angry that we didn't have enough drugs and she left. And, and the dog who happened to not be on a leash that day stayed with me. You know, it was, it was one of those things. The dog didn't let me down. And I sure wasn't going to let the dog down. So I couldn't work with the dog on the train. Right? And, and because I wasn't going to leave the dog, that's what kind of put me homeless in New York City. Wow. And, you know, Mike feel same to this day laughs at this. But I didn't even realize what I'm about to tell you until like two years ago because I would have a sign. I would have a, a, a you know, a help me out, I'm homeless, blah, blah, blah. And, and it occurred to me every couple of days to write out a new sign and say different things and see if it helped my donations. So yes, I split tested marketing. <laughs> I split tested marketing in the 80s with my homeless sign. Wow. Yeah. By the way, the winner, the control, was something to the effect of, hi, I'm homeless, you know, help me out, help my dog out. In the meantime, I'm just going to clean up our city, have a nice day. And I would pick up garbage with the bag, me and the dog. And, you know, we got, we got pretty good money until, uh, you know, I, I moved to Florida and, you know, that was a new chapter. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but, uh, hey, you want to talk about, like, the – you know, the five, the four or five areas where people, where I think people's mindset let them down, lets them down. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Well, the first one is thinking there's a knowledge gap. And that really mm -hmm. kind of, that's the end of that, right? Because yeah. there isn't one, right? The second one is, to, for me, it's the most dangerous sentence in American business, right? And it is this. If it's going to get done right, it's going to be because I did it myself. So, yeah. Right? That has cost more billions than I'll bet I, anybody could count. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I'm very, very into 80-20. Uh, and, you know, it's this whole obsession, science. There's so much more to it than the catchphrases. Right? Mm. And, you know, I've come to learn that if you're in the top 20% of the top 20%, so the top 4% of, yeah. any, of any skill, you are, and this is a hard and fast math fact, you are 16 times the value of the average. Yes. Right? And uh, when, you, when you encounter someone who's also in the top 4% of a, of a complementary skill, they don't add to each other they, so it's not 16 plus 16, it's 16 times oh, 16. Yeah. For example, if you have a top 4% marketer working with a top 4% sales closer, the closer is uh, closing 16x against 16x of incoming leads, right? So that's a rabbit hole all by itself. But the, the, like the big goal in business is A, to launch, to get off your butt and do it because 90% don't, right? So the biggest one is that. And the second biggest one is your only job really in business is to optimize yourself into your fourness and optimize everything else into somebody else's fourness. Yeah. So, you know, there's that rant. What would be a third yeah. one? I haven't really thought about what these four what or five that? things are. What was the first one? We missed that. The, the line went a bit funny. What was the first one? Oh, just getting started. Just going. Just launching. Yeah. Because it's, it's a simple thing. And I'm not sure exactly which stage of business that your listeners are. But mm -hmm. in the internet marketing world, for every person who's doing, there's a hundred people who are, who've been planning to do for a decade. Yes. Yeah. So... Yeah. So we have to honor we have to honor the big monster and call it what it is. It's the biggest challenge in American business. 
starting. Yeah, I lost your audio for a little. I got I got the gist of it. You know, execution is better above a million. But you know why that is, by the way, Barry? I, I've I've thought about why that's true, and I believe it is. I think the reason that that's true is, you know, as a copywriter, I've come to learn that the human condition is pretty much universal. There, there really are only about 10 or 12 problems, really, which is convenient if you're a writer. Once you get over a million, you have a team that yes. is counting on you. And it's easier to let ourselves down than it is to let people that are counting on us. I, yes. I think that's why it's easier to scale above a million. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, like I, 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 yeah, I agree completely. Execution to that seven fifty mark, and by that stage, you know, you, you have to have somebody or some bodies on your team. And you're right; is that you know, it will do far more. It's proven that we'll do far more to keep a million dollars to hold on to a million dollars, and we will go and make it <coughs> far more. You know, we'll far, you know, we're easier to let us down than it is to other people. So you're exactly, like, I agree 100% with what you're saying is that you get to that point, you're then forced internally, there's some form of internal motivation in continuing on from that point of view. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the strongest human desires ever is the desire not to be uh, considered less than yeah. or not to be ridiculed or, or thought bad of no, I, with your peers. Oh. Same yeah, man. that desire to belong, you know, it comes back from that ancient times is that, you know, if you look at the creature neurology is, you know, we're looking for a sense of reproduction, you know, to, to breed, and we're looking for a sense of belonging, you know, which is that fight or flight, be, being safe within a herd, naturally. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, I've had the misfortune of, you know, having to, to let go of you know, I call it the standing on the chair. When you have to stand on a chair and let 50 people go who didn't do anything wrong. Mm. That's, I would, I would rather eat dirt than ever do that. And that's the feeling that drives an entrepreneur over a million dollars is, mm. you know, they're still saddled with mm. the same, you know, challenges mentally as, as everybody else. But that motivation to not let down your team is very strong. Yeah. 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 So let's so you, want, to, you want to know what the third, you know, you want to know what the yeah. third thing yeah. is that, that limits people? Imposter syndrome. Yes. I don't yes. deserve this. I'm tricking people somehow. Now, I had a conversation directly with Tony Robbins, who I spent yeah. some time with back yeah. in 2005. And, and I talked to him about that. You know, I said, listen, people are going to figure this out. I'm just a normal guy, right? You know, they think I'm a hero because I'm making money. And uh, boy, that's a loaded statement all by itself. But uh, Tony, you know, shared with me that he had that same conversation with uh, Silence of the Lambs, uh, Anthony Hopkins, who felt like he's one of the greatest actors of our time, right? And he felt like it was a trick. He, he said to Tony, uh, Tony relayed to me that he felt like he was stealing it. And Tony's advice to him and me was, well, focus on being the world's best Steve because it's working so far. Yeah. Right? So imposter syndrome kills careers. I, I, or, I've, got or, an, yeah. I've got an interesting saying about that. And that is in a family full of thieves, the one who doesn't steal feels guilty. Now, so in a family full of thieves, the one who doesn't steal feels guilty. Now, this is where, you know, like when, we, when we're talking about doing a lot of work um, from a psychological family systems perspective is that they've proven that we can take on board family patterning for up to 10 generations before us. And, you know, if we've come from a family that hasn't necessarily bred the same experience than what we're having once again that part of our creature neurology fires off because to some part of us we don't belong in the system that's created us which is where i feel a lot of this imposter syndrome comes from and if we're not able to integrate that experience we can go out there and consciously unconsciously sabotage those experiences to allow us to feel like we belong again like look at the stats around the people that win win, win lotto i think it's like 98 percent of people that win lottery within two years of winning the lottery 
are worse off financially than before they won the lottery. And, mm -hmm. and studies show us because that part of them doesn't feel like they belong anymore. And so they seek about sabotaging that experience, not consciously. Everyone, everyone I speak to, and probably even the viewers and listeners out there are saying, well, if I won two million bucks, you know, like I would keep it. I would, I would hang on to it. Don't you reckon <coughs> 98% of people thought that same thing? Now, it's one thing to think this stuff consciously, but remember, it's often not our conscious thoughts that are driving a lot of these habitual behaviors, right? It's that yeah. unconscious desire and need to belong, to survive, to thrive. Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll go out on a limb for the listeners, right? And say, first off, I, I agree completely. And the lottery winners are a little screwed, which means that the listeners are a little less screwed, right? Because they're a little different. I'll share what works for me and, and it'll work for the vast majority of listeners. Here are the rules, right? If you're a provider of any service that's valuable and you've provided the service to any number higher than 10 or 20 people, right? I'm going to take objectivity. I'm going to take human emotion out for a minute because, again, with my self-esteem challenges, I have to mm. because my emotions will always tell me that I'm an imposter, right? Mm. But you, the listener, I'm looking the camera right in the eye. Try this exercise. If you've served more than 10 people or 20, you know, that, then it's st statistically significant. If you've served, you know, five, roll with me, right? Ask yourself some scientific questions. Are those people better off after having received your thing than not? Assuming that the preponderance of the answer is yes, then ask them if the majority of those people, or all of them, got value beyond your price. Mm. It's an objective question, mm. right? You can't, your, your, your psyche shouldn't be permitted into this discussion, right? And then, you know, look at the accolades. Look at what they said afterwards. Oh, I'd do that again in a second. Or, mm. or did they re-up on your service? Or did mm. they go right on Facebook what a jerk you were? Mm. It happens, right? And that, this is science. It has its two edges to the sword. But I'm willing to bet that most people doing that exercise are going to get a, an objective, I'm worth it, from the marketplace. That's how I got, that's how I came to have the, the you know, the look, I was charging a tenth what I charge now. Like, there aren't a lot of copywriters out there that do this better than I do. John Carlton does, for sure. Mm -hmm. but, but you get it? Like, I happen to be in this tiny little specialty of business to consumer sales copy, I know from the math how good I am at this. And it's a good feeling when you can own it. Mm. So there. Mm. Mm. God. I, I, I love the conversations around, uh, you know, mindset, performance psychology, because I, I believe in my heart and know firsthand that that's, that's the gift is, you know, having people that can hold you accountable to your word, you know, because they can hold you accountable to, to your worth as well as your word. But, but honestly, you know, the game starts on the inside. You know, the game doesn't yeah. start on the court. The game starts in all the preparation before you even get on the court. And that's what I feel a lot of people, that's where there's a bit of a disconnect or misunderstanding is if I just had the right strategy or if the market just wanted what I'm selling or, you know, blah, 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 blah as opposed to understanding and realizing that you are the creator of your experience. You are the creator of your environment and the results that you're getting. And it all starts with that inner game. Yeah. You know, a little addition to that is, man, I'm thinking of some people by name. If I was just a little snarkier, I'd name them. But, you know, I have discovered a surefire way to tell if a copywriter is going to succeed or not. In 20 years, I've never been wrong about this. It's the copywriter that, that looks at the market and says, ooh, look, that's where all the money and respect is. I'll go do that. Mm. And they make a conscious decision to write sales copy based on the fact that copywriters are pretty highly paid, right? 
I haven't seen one of those guys win ever. Right? Mm -hmm. All the, all the, for example, like all the really good copywriters came into it by accident or because they had to. Yeah. Right? And like the, the, the reason I make that point is the first thing is the thing has to not suck to you what it is that you're doing. Mm. Right? Like people, a lot of people look at that in the entrepreneurial world, it's kind of a given, right? Mm. But not. But workers think it's honorable to do something they hate for 40 years to get a gold watch. Mm. Foreign concept to me. We have the ability, we actually have the responsibility to, to be really happy with what we're doing for mm. our work. Mm. And, and I could make it, I mean, we could take this call out to hours and I could make a perfectly scientific argument for why that's a, a, a marketplace truth in addition to being a woo-woo coolness thing. Mm. Huh. You have to be happy at it. That's the first thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree because it's that... It's that passion and inspiration inside that, that pushes you way past um, the monetary motivations, which is where many people come from. And, you know, what I've noticed in my time too is that the clients that come in that are purely driven by money is the moment they reach those goals, they're more, they're more fucked up than when they started. And what I mean by that is because they've chased these goals for so long, it's become part of their identity or part of the way that they identify with themselves. And the moment yeah. that they have that, there's this sense of realization that in actual fact, I'm, I'm more unfulfilled and lost now than before, because before at least I had something I was moving towards. And as human beings, and Tony Robbins talks a lot about this, we, we have a desire to grow. And if we're not growing, if we're not green and growing, we're up and running, right? Yeah. And so once you achieve that target, sure, we can go into the bigger financial target, but often that's the, that's the kind of, I say, come to Jesus moment where people go, oh my God, what does I really want now? If it's not money, a lot of people don't even get there because the, the drive for money is not strong enough to overcome the challenges and objections and adversity that comes along the way. But the ones yeah. that do persist and get there, most of them have that experience where it's like, hang on, Life is actually about more than dollars and cents. What is yeah. it that's going to fulfill me? And that's where the game gets interesting. That's where that, that game it's, comes from. Because they become inspired and unstoppable, finding what they're longing to have. It's the loneliest club out there, man. Uh, like, thank you for saying that. Because it's so true. It, you get to this point where not only did the things not make you happy, but mm -hmm. it's, like a, it's like a slap in the face because, look, I, I didn't have a Lamborghini because I've driven them. They don't shift good, or they didn't, mm -hmm. you know, when I was looking for one. I had an Acura NSX, $110,000 uh, Acura. And, you know, my house had an elevator in it and 7,000 square feet. And here's a little, here's something that nobody talks about, Right. When I would pick between my, when I had to go to the store, I would take my Civic and leave the NSX parked because A, I was married, I didn't need to pick up girls, and B, the damn thing bottomed out over every speed bump, right? And the tires were $4,000 a set. And I'm a cheapskate, right? So, and, oh, and I got stuck in the elevator once at my house. That'll give you nightmares. Right, because there's no bellman to call. Right, we were yelling between floors because I didn't have my cell phone on me. Yeah, you get it. So not only did they not fulfill the goal, they're boat anchors. Yeah, it's like a negative asset owning these things because you're tied down. Like all the cool people I know now, like you know Mitch Miller, uh, Erica Blair. You know a lot of a lot of the cool kids now don't even have addresses. You know, mm -hmm. they, they just travel whenever and wherever they want. That's wealth. Like that's yeah. like, the, that's the new wealth from where I sit. Well, the ability to do what you want, when you want, how you want, with who you want. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm leading this charge for, I don't want people to say rich anymore. 
or, or wealthy. I want to say optioned. Optioned. I want to be yeah. optioned. Yeah. Optioned. I love that. I love that. So, mate, um, look, we could we could very easily talk all day and all night without a doubt. This has been really fascinating. And I trust for the the viewers and listeners out there in just as inspiring to them as, as what it has has for me. Um, what I'd love to know before we wrap things up, though, is, is, you know, what's in the future for Tom? You know, like, where do you see life moving forwards from here for you? Um, and then equally too, you know, like, what can myself or, or, or the listeners or viewers out there do to support, to support you on that, if anything? Well, uh, you know, I have some, I have some seminars and, you know, joint ventures coming up and, you know, I'm, I'm Thomas Bell on Facebook. I'm the guy, uh, in the picture with Tony Robbins. I think there's a few Thomas Bells. Um, but in, in a nutshell, you know, here's a secret, you know, don't tell anybody, but I really, really get off on helping people who do, who take the advice and do it. Right. Mm. So I'm pretty easy to get, you know, some, some tips or pointers and, you know, I'll just blow my own horn for a minute so we can communicate. I'm pretty good with copy and I'm pretty good with taking businesses to scale. Mm. Right. And, and like, for example, when you talk to, uh, do you mind me asking Barry, have you scaled something over a million so far? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll lay down a challenge. Most people who've never seen North of a million, if you ask them, what is the biggest competitive challenge to a million dollar plus business, you only know if you've been there. Mm. You, you want to try it, or or you, or I'll just say it. So you know, it's merchant processing. I love to hear from you. Yeah. It's merchant processing. Like no somebody who's who's dealing with Stripe and PayPal now, they're gonna have a they're gonna mm. have some trouble. Merchant processing is the biggest mm. threat to a million dollar plus information company. But in a nutshell, the, the thing that, that I love to do is I love to take existing offers. That from, are from online perspective, yeah. Yeah, I love, to, I love to come into existing offers and make them better. That's yeah. kind of my specialty. I, 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 when I write copy, I'm, you know, I'm cheaper than Carlton, but uh, I'm pretty expensive. But if I can't take the offer from where it is to someplace bigger, I don't charge them a nickel. So, mm. you know, if any of your, your listeners are looking for, you know, for copy or just free business tips, uh, you know, if you take up a lot of time, I'll send you a bill. But I love helping people in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. I think um, it's interesting, like a lot of um, pretty much all the companies that, that I've personally scaled or we've scaled haven't uh, been utilizing merchant facilities. But I think that, that what you shared is still very, very valid um, is that, you know, number one that I've seen is the ability for the business owner to continue to grow within themselves and, you know, not get comfortable with the level of success. But I think secondly is the cash is definitely like, especially if you're looking at a product based business where you might have a long lead time between buying, purchasing the product and getting paid for the product there's a limitation to how quick you can scale those businesses. And I've seen businesses go bankrupt because they've scaled too fast and haven't been able to keep up with that, with that payment cycle. So I think yeah. that it's very, very, very valid advice. Um, look, what's one thing, what's one thing that you'd like to, to leave with the listeners and the viewers out there to, to ponder, to think about, to implement their business? Do something different today. Whatever stage in business you are, Test something and track the results. That's the most valuable advice I could ever give. Awesome. Do something different today and test the results. Yeah. Yeah. That, that applies to anybody, anywhere, pretty much any time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Barry, we got to do this again. Awesome, Thomas. Look, mate, absolutely loved it. Uh, to the guys out there, as he said, Thomas Bell on Facebook is the guy in the photo with Tony, Tony Robbins, the real Thomas Bell. Uh, hit him up, obviously. Uh, feel free to like, share, and comment uh, on this video or audio to people you think might get, uh, might get value benefit. And be sure to comment back and let us know what you're, you're taking out of these uh, podcasts. 
because we'd love to hear feedback. We'd love to get an idea of, of what you'd like to hear from us as well. So uh, hashtag the comeback game inspired unstoppable and look forward to speaking to you guys and seeing you on the next episode. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks much, Barry.